Thanks, Ross. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining uh, the Greater Manchester COVID briefing. Um, we will get straight on with showing you the latest data. So if somebody could put up the uh, first table, please. So as you can see, um, very much following the, the national trend, I believe now, uh, we're seeing a, a significant decrease across all boroughs uh, in Greater Manchester. Um, a very big difference uh, if you look at the week ending the 6th of January to the, to the 13th. Um, one caveat to put on this, and it's a fairly big one, uh, is that we do think with the change uh, to testing arrangements and greater reliance on lateral flow testing, these figures probably are under under reporting um, the level of uh, of infection that's out there. But but we would not not in any way to suggest that the the trend is not significantly downwards, uh, which we we believe it is, which is which is good news. If we could go on to the next table, over 60s, uh, seeing a very similar uh, picture there with decreases in all all boroughs. Um, still a little over England average, and that's the the case uh, for the um, for the overall figures. Uh, but huge decrease uh, week on week, uh, which of course uh, of course is, is encouraging uh, to us. If we could go on to the next uh, slide, which is the age breakdown. Now this is worth just looking at for a moment um, because um, uh, what what we're beginning to see, I suppose, that the main thing to point you towards on this table is that bottom line of the of, of the chart the 0 to 15 line where you will just see a darkening again um at the the right hand side so obviously that's the return of schools is beginning to show uh, a rise in infection amongst the 0 to 15 uh, age range um so that is obviously just something as well to bear in mind with the overall the overall picture and the return of university students as well will need to be uh, to be factored factored into this. So uh, overall, an improving picture, but just obviously with those uh, with those caveats in mind. If we might move on to the next slide, please. Uh, so obviously a, a picture in, in our care homes, which has got slightly more challenging as we've we've gone through. Uh, overwhelmingly, this is not resulting in uh, you know, much more serious illness as we've seen with uh, with, with with the general population. Um, and over, overwhelmingly, people are being supported in in their uh, in their settings and not requiring hospitalisation. But nevertheless, obviously, uh, we, we keep a, a close a close watch on on these uh, figures for obvious reasons. Uh, but we hope um, that we will uh, see increasingly the same trend uh, developing uh, as we're seeing across the rest of the population. If we could look at the next slide, please. There we go. Just go back one. So this is obviously encouraging in that the, the figures that, that we've presented obviously increasingly now are, uh, are if you like, backed up by the uh, hospitalisation data. So a uh, fall, a significant fall on weekly admissions uh, for patients whose obviously primary diagnosis is COVID-19, uh, but also a fairly significant drop now in the number of people being diagnosed within the hospital setting. Um, and that too is beginning to be felt with regard to the position in beds. Although uh, it is important for me to say that at um, that 1,200 level, there or thereabouts, uh, in terms of the number of patients um, in, um, in general hospital beds, that is not as high as it got to in 2020, but it's not that far off. So, you know, this is still representing significant uh, pressure uh, on the hospital uh, system, uh, albeit not transferring through into pressure on uh, high dependency or intensive care beds. But nevertheless, it's, this is a huge pressure on the hospital system. And as we know, the NHS overall uh, is, is still under, under very significant uh, pressure. If we might move to vaccination, please. There you have uh, the breakdown, um, a picture that continues to, to, to creep up. Now we're looking particularly at that uh, line 18 to 49, 37% having had their booster. Now some of that figure has been held back by the number of infections that have been out there and the people have been able to take up their, their booster. 
as as case rates come down, we would obviously hope to get that uh, back up. And I would just want to put this in the government's mind with regard to thinking around what comes what comes next. We think it's very important not to uh, do what was done last week and give the impression that um, it's all over and people can can stop worrying. It, it, it clearly isn't, uh, and there are ongoing risks of new new variants. Of course, we would want to move um, sensibly towards a, a place where people have uh, fewer uh, restrictions uh, on them, of course, and we want to support uh, the uh, the city centre and get people back to work where we where we can. But obviously, it's important that we don't give the message that um, that, that that all uh, all, all pressure is off and um, and and there's nothing to worry about. We think it's very important that we continue to get the message out there that people need to come forward for their for their booster uh, when they can. Um, if you look at those vaccination figures, it does mean if you take obviously younger people into account and people who have exemptions. Uh, from the vaccine that still around 60% of the population in Greater Manchester has not had their booster, uh, had a booster jab. Therefore, there is still a high degree of susceptibility to Omicron. And it's really important for us to, to continue to, to stress that. Um, I'll finish on a couple of NHS related points, if I may, before opening up to your uh, to your questions uh, today. Um, firstly, um, to um, uh, raise a concern that was discussed at the, the committee today, which is the position with regard to mandatory vaccination of, um, of NHS staff. Uh, it is a concern that has um, been brought to us by trade union colleagues who are reporting that there is uh, some um, uh, difficulty uh, with this issue uh, amongst the workforce and a, and a proportion of people who are saying they won't come forward. Obviously, the the 1st of February deadline is looming. And as we understand it, for those who do not uh, take up the vaccination, it's not a case of redundancy, it's termination of contracts. It's a very kind of serious uh, situation, particularly with the ongoing pressure uh, on the NHS. Uh, I personally would prefer, prefer a position where people are strongly encouraged um, rather than mandated. Uh, obviously, there's an argument to be to be had about that. But I would say to the government that they do need to keep an eye on this issue um, and ensure that we're not seeing the loss of significant numbers of NHS staff as that deadline as that deadline gets closer. Uh, so it's a, a concern that um, uh, has been has been registered, if you like, uh, this morning at our at our meeting. The um, uh, second uh, message that we were very keen to to get over to people. Though there is considerable pressure in the system, as I as I said before, uh, we, we don't want people to feel that they can't come forward uh, and seek support from the NHS. And have been some signs that people perhaps are holding back again. The message is today very much one as if if you need to see your GP, if you need if you're concerned, um, uh, please uh, obviously uh, seek uh, support and uh, obviously if if necessary attend A and E. Uh, the very the message from this system is that you know, we want people to continue to come forward uh, should they need the support of the NHS. It's very much there for you, uh, and people should should use it if if they feel they they need to. And I'll finish on this point, Ross, before turning back to you and um, uh, opening up to people's questions. In that vein, um, some good news to report today is that a uh, decision has been taken uh, across the Greater Man Manchester system uh, to restart elective activity and that is happening this week. I think I said to you a couple of weeks ago that it would be kept under regular review. It has been kept under uh, review and a decision has been taken now uh, to, to restart activity. Probably we'll begin with day cases and then uh, move to other procedures as as um, as, as we get, uh, get get into a position where where that can be can be done. Um, patients who have had operations or procedures cancelled should just wait to hear uh, from the NHS but the good news is that it is it is uh, starting uh, starting again um, and uh, hopefully as we make further uh, progress on the number of people who are in hospital who can be discharged uh, we'll be able to, to progressively increase uh, the level of activity and get back to what might resemble a normal a normal level of, of service 
but there is obviously, as I keep stressing, uh, considerable pressure on the system. So people will will have to, to bear with our NHS colleagues. Uh, so, Ross, I think I, I will leave it there. Some good news to report from, from the Greater Manchester NHS there. Uh, I know it will be um, well received by patients who've been frustrated by the current situation, have been worried uh, and um, you know, glad to be able to, to say that today. I'll hand back to you, Ross, and we'll go through people's questions from here. Thanks very much. Thanks, Andy. If colleagues in the media could indicate if they'd like a, to ask a question by ticking the raise hand uh, button at the top of the screen, I will just give people uh, a couple of seconds um, just to do that to indicate if they'd like to ask a question. I'm um, going to go to um, Rowan Bridge um, at the BBC first. Uh, Rowan, you should be able to unmute yourself now and ask your question. You just need to unmute yourself, Rowan, sorry. Can't hear us. No, I know. Just wait, I'm hoping that Rowan will be able to tick uh, the unmute button. I've unlocked his microphone and he should be able to just unmute himself in the normal way. While, Rowan, are you able to unmute yourself? I know we've had problems with this before. Rowan, while you do that, I'm going to, I'll leave your microphone unlocked. Um, I'm going to go to Andrew Knoll. Um, Andrew, you should be able to unmute your microphone now and ask your question. Yeah, can you hear me? We can. Thanks, Ross. Um, yeah, Andy, on, um, on mandatory vaccination there, you said you would prefer encouragement to mandating of vaccination in the workforce. So I was just wondering if I could ask you a bit more about how you see that might actually work when the vaccination programme, um, you know, has been running for nearly a year and it's been known that care and NHS staff will probably have to have the vaccine to keep working for several months now if people are still not convinced in those industries that they're going to come forward now what should be said now to you know to do that without them having to lose their jobs thanks andrew it's a difficult situation um and i i know that there will be many people who support uh what the government has tried to do here and um uh and you can understand if you like the reasons that lie behind it it was pointed out at our committee meeting today that Already, NHS staff are required to um, have a number of, of vaccinations before they start work with regard to hepatitis or um, MMR or other vaccinations. So, you know, it is obviously already part of of, of standard practice. But it, the question is, it's the it's, you might say the context in which this uh, particular requirement is being introduced and the way it's being being done um, it is fairly heavy handed to say that it's a termination you know it's a uh, it's causing as i said before some concerns amongst uh, trade union colleagues and the question comes down to it you can see what it's trying to achieve but if we get to a point where we're a couple of weeks away from the implementation of this and you know there are significant numbers of nhs staff who are not uh not not doing it you know what what then you know and I don't think anyone wants to see, I personally don't want to see the termination of NHS staff contracts at this particular moment in time. So it's just simply to raise the concern, Andrew, you know, this is a, um, a challenging situation for the NHS. Um, you know, the the intention here is obviously to, to, to get people vaccinated, but obviously also to support the workforce and uh, relieve pressure on the system. And the question is, is this policy going to achieve what it wants to achieve or could it cause a problem in a different part uh, of the NHS and I think that does need to be kept under review uh, at this particular moment in, in time and it was obviously a concern raised at our meeting our meeting today. Thanks Andy. Uh, I'm going to go back to Rowan and see if he's able to um, click the unmute button and unmute his microphone. Um, if not, um, I'm going to ask Rowan if he could um, drop me a It's not message. a ploy Rowan, it's not a... I know, honestly. Um, the BBC is under pressure this week. <laughs> Honestly, it's not a attempt to silence you. Um, well, <laughs> you want to put uh, it in the chat, maybe Ross, or uh... we, we don't have a chat. Sorry, Andy. So if I think if um, if Rowan's able to to email um, or message me, um, I'll ask his question. Bro. 
after Simon Williams, um, who I'm hoping will be able to unmute himself. Um, Simon, if you could just say who you are and where you're from and ask your question, please. Yeah, it's uh, Simon from Global Radio. Um, one thing that the slides didn't show at the beginning, obviously the number of people in hospital is falling, but the, the, the other part of the pressure on the NHS is staffing levels at the moment. How are we looking about that at the moment, the number of, of staff just not being able to go into work? Thanks, uh, Simon. So um, th there has been a, an improvement uh, there. Um, as that has in pretty much all of our public services. So we have been monitoring um, staff absence uh, in recent weeks, particularly then as it affects the uh, continuity of, uh, of service provision. Um, all, of our, all of our public services to one degree or another uh, are reporting a slight improvement in that, in that position. Uh, so Greater Manchester Police, Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service, um, pressures of ease a little in adult social care although that is where it remains most difficult with regard to the numbers of of staff absences and i think also it's a slightly improving position across across the nhs now the reason i just you know hesitate is because you know i, I said to you obviously we've got schools coming back you know we've still got a very high case rate so um while there are grounds for optimism with the way uh this wave is now Kind of appearing to diminish quite quickly, you know. Obviously, we 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 can't completely um, uh, uh, kind of say it's problem solved because it isn't. You know, we're keeping a very close watch uh, on, on on the system. There has been a change, obviously, to self isolation rules, uh, which which may help. Um, the other way of looking at it, of course, is that if people are coming back to work earlier, there may be a more risk uh, uh, there. So all of these issues continue, will be monitored uh, carefully, and we we will. Um, uh, you know, we, we, we will be um, uh, watching closely. I raised the, the staff uh, vaccination issue in the NHS, partly for this reason as well, of course, because absences are likely to continue into into February. Uh, and so there is a bit of a, you know, a moment arriving here where, uh, you know, we, we could see some disruption uh, with regard to, to NHS staffing. So, uh, yeah, it's an improving picture. Thanks, Andy. Um, I've got Rowan's question here, which I'll, I'll ask from so Rowan Bridge from BBC News. Um, his question is, how much are, are you worried about complacency setting in, given that you know, many of the cases are mild, the government's reducing um, isolation times. So do you feel that, um, are you worried that complacency may be setting in? Yes, I'm glad you did get your question over, Rowan, because it's a, a good question and we spoke about that uh, today. Uh, it feels as though we may be getting back into a position where People will hear pandemic is over, it's uh, back to normal. Um, and uh, colleagues, experts on our call this morning were at pains to say, you know, that isn't the message that we should be uh, giving out. Yes, of course, we can uh, be glad that we're moving in a, a better direction, but there will still be a need for, for sensible uh, measures as we go, go forward. Uh, there definitely is a need to stress that people should come forward for their booster if they are now eligible to take it up. Obviously, the high case rate over the Christmas uh, period has meant some people perhaps have had to delay getting their booster. But we would say to those people now, please do uh, come come forward um, because it's uh, you know clear from the figures that we presented that that booster is working in terms of stopping um, uh, people being seriously uh, ill from from COVID. We have the news around 16 to 17 year olds being able to access the booster. Uh, program again we would say uh, to them in terms of protecting yourself for the rest of this year and with everything you've got ahead in terms of exams and, uh, and other things uh, and wanting to you know get back to life uh, as you want it to be you know again go and take up that offer of a booster because that's that's likely to put you in a stronger position for the rest of 2022 so w w we are worried a little um uh, rowan that the message might go back to one of you know, Freedom Day and all the rest of it. We don't think that was right then. We don't think it would be right now. The risk of new variants remains. Um, and so while we are uh, in a better position, uh, let's proceed with, with some degree of caution here. Um, you know, let's do what we can to, 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 to be able to let people um, uh, get back to what they want to do. But let's just, just not go to a point where we just abandon everything. You know, there is a risk here that the rules are becoming more complicated. People are becoming less and less certain about what to do with regards to reporting a test um, or uh, how, how to self-isolate. Um, 
we it's a difficult message but but we do want to stress to people you know i think the public have got more and more used uh, to using lateral flows over uh, over this period particularly the christmas period with visiting relatives and, uh, and and other things i think it's a good habit to get into and what we would say to people is please report every result um negative and positive i know some people are probably not reporting negative results but we would ask people to do that uh, it just helps um, with overall data collection uh, for, for NHS colleagues. So please continue to use lateral flows will be one of our messages. And please continue to report the results, both negative and positive. Uh, and those are the kind of sensible things we now should be doing as we move through this period. Thanks, Andy. We're going to go to um, Helena. Um, Helena, you should be able to open up your mic now uh, and ask your question. Can't hear Helena, sorry. Helena, it looks like you have unmuted, so. Is that better? Be able... Yeah. Is that better? You know. oh, you know, yeah. Perfect, sorry about that. Um, a couple of questions from me. Firstly, do you think all COVID measures currently in place should be lifted on January 26th when Plan B runs out? And secondly, can we get an update um, on staff absence within social care? Have you managed to find out a more precise figure to the level of staff sick or isolating within care homes? Thanks, Helena. So on your first question, I mean, obviously we uh, want to see um, people returning um, to, to work, obviously, because that helps support uh, the Greater Manchester economy. So um, I, I would imagine that um, uh, we would support um, a, a, you know, a, a kind of greater ability for people to uh, to go back to the uh, to, to the office environment. Um, what what was clear from uh, from the consensus on the Greater Manchester call this morning is that we don't believe there should just be a, an abandonment of everything, as we said last time. Uh, we think it is right to continue to ask people to wear uh, face coverings in enclosed spaces on public transport, um, potentially in. Uh, in, in supermarkets, so you know we, um, we we would ask that that be borne in mind. There was some briefing around at the weekend that suggested the government was going in that direction. Uh, we think that will be we will be a sensible a sensible place to go. I mean, the truth of the matter is, you know, we've obviously lived through a, um, a an Omicron wave here, or we're living through it, and we're hopefully coming to the other side of it. But there could be, and there will be, uh, other variants that we have to contend with. Uh, later later this year. So let's not repeat the mistake of last year, which I think was a mistake in implying that it was all over because it isn't all over. Um, you know, we've got to um, to be careful um, because obviously the position in a different country could affect us. So we can't just look at our own our own situation and, and, and think that that's uh, that's that's all sorted. So um, that's where we are, uh, if you like, on uh, on that in terms of adult social care. So rather than obviously it's difficult for adult social care, given the multiplicity of settings um, in terms of where care is given and there's domiciliary care as well. What, what we are looking at is a, a sort of red, amber, green rating across across the 10, the 10 districts with regard to um, adult social care. And the truth of the matter is it, it's a mix. So in a couple of about two or three of our boroughs, there are particular pressures on the adult social care uh, system. Um, and there is some work going on between our districts to support each other uh, through this. It, it is a slightly improving picture, uh, as it is for other public services, as I said. But adult social care re remains very much, um, uh, if you like, at the top of our list of concerns. And we had a specific presentation uh, on it uh, on it this morning. Um, and um, as I say, it, it says that there are still considerable issues. Um, but um, they are beginning to ease as they are in other, other public services. Thank you. I'm going to go to uh, Maya. Uh, Maya, you should be able to open up your microphone now. Hiya. Um, Hi. I just wonder if you could put a um, number or a percentage on the number of staff that the NHS might risk losing in the region um, in regards to the mandatory vaccines. So it is difficult uh, to, to put a figure on that, uh, Maya, because obviously it, it's a prediction at this point in time as opposed to, if you like, hard evidence. The experience with social care 
was that um, the, the higher number did progressively come down uh, and I think ended up in a very low single figure percentage with regard to the number of people who were actually made redundant or who had contracts uh, terminated. From speaking to trade union colleagues last week, they expressed a concern that it was you know, still a higher number of staff who were expressing misgivings about the policy. So I, I, if I give you the wrong figure here, I will go back and correct it later today. But I think it's between the five and 10% uh, level um, where concerns are being, are being expressed. Now, obviously, the policy is now entering the kind of critical phase, if you like, isn't it, where people will have to make their decision about what, what they are going, going to do. But it is certainly a concern um, that, that has been been raised with us by a number of both trade union colleagues and, and people working within within the NHS. Um, and um, it, it will change, obviously, as people uh, have to confront the deadline. Uh, but it's certainly, I wouldn't say it's in double figures, but it's, it's certainly in, in single figures. But, but um, you know, the concern is that it's higher than, um, than, it, than it can safely be. Uh, for the NHS right now, given the uh, the pressures on staffing. Um, Andy, I've got a question from uh, Kevin Fitzpatrick. Um, it's an issue with his mic um, rather than uh, our system, I think. Um, so Kevin Fitzpatrick at Radio Manchester. Two questions. Yeah. What's the justification for putting the pre police precept up by £10? And the second part of the question is Radio Manchester are running a story about the need for more electric charging points today. What is Greater Manchester's plan to address the shortage, especially as under the clean air zone, more people are being encouraged to go electric? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, so on the first um, first part of your question, you may remember this time last year, um, I didn't uh, agree to a full precept increase for Greater Manchester Police. Um, so um, back then, the government had suggested a £15 increase, and I didn't do that. Um, given the um, concerns that uh, were being widely expressed about Greater Manchester Police, it didn't feel right to, um, if you like, just say, you know, throw money at, at, at the problem. A message had to be sent that we expected uh, Greater Manchester Police to um, uh, to to uh, sort sort out the internal problems that it had. Obviously, a year on, we are in a very different position where we have a new chief constable who set out a new plan that um, I think uh, commands broad uh, support, where we're talking of doubling the number of arrests, attending every burglary, um, massively uh, focusing on uh, the uh, communications uh, branch, uh, whereby we want to see improvements in 101 call handling times and 999. Uh, and that is a big focus um, for uh, any precept, if agreed, uh, com coming in uh, to the system, as well as continuing to repair the damage with regard to loss of staff at the, at the front line. And we're getting close to a point now where, uh, if you like, half of the damage has been repaired. So the 2,000 officers that we lost, we're getting close now to having 1,000 officers uh, back. Uh, so, you know, continuing to, um, uh, to, to to put resource in to bring GMP back up to where we all want it to be. So that's the the, the, the clear justification, uh, Kevin. Um, we didn't give uh, GMP the full increase last year, uh, but we now have a, a chief constable that's uh, commanding a considerable de degree of confidence. We have a, a police force where morale is rising as a result. We have a plan that the public uh, strongly uh, support. Uh, it feels that this is the time to, to back the chief constable, back our police force and the direction in which they're, they're going. Uh, and I believe the, um, the public will want to do that, uh, given obviously how important these, these issues are to people. On your second point about EV uh, charging, obviously we have been beginning to make further strides uh, on that. We uh, have seen a number of new um, uh, electric vehicle charging points go in last year with our with our partner, uh, and we're looking at uh, around 200 more uh, going in going in this year. Um, obviously, the, the clean air zone is not just about electric uh, vehicles; it's um, uh, much broader than that. Uh, but obviously, this these measures are hopefully self-supporting. Uh, 
um, and we'll continue to update on the, the rollout of EV charging points uh, throughout the course of this year. Thanks. I'm going to go to Jen. Jen, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, can hear you, Jim. Excellent. Um, on, um, just to follow up on, on Kevin's point about police precept, um, I know you didn't put it up uh, by the maximum last year, but you have put it up previously, and during that time, GMP has got worse. So why would people want to pay more tax now when their tax previously hasn't led to improvements? And what, what did that money go on if GMP actually declined during that period? And just on the clean air zone, I think you've said a couple of times that um, you are uh, interested in looking at what alternatives might be available to the plan that's currently uh, drawn up and you're looking to go back and talk to the government about that. I wonder if you could just expand on what any of those alternatives um, might look like and whether or not any internal work has begun on, on sort of researching and analysing what that might be. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Uh, so on uh, the, um, the first part, of your question related to policing. I mean, we were in a difficult position um, if we go back a few years where the central police grant was still being cut. So obviously GMP is more reliant on uh, the funding it receives from central government than other police forces because of our council tax base. The central grant makes up more of the budget than it, than it does for other areas. So in some ways, we were having to ask local residents to, if you like, patch up some of the problems that, that, that were coming from those from those those cuts. In terms of what they saw for that, well, they saw more police numbers. You know, we, we began progressively increasing the numbers from 2017, 2018, 2019, uh, to a point now where, as I say, we're, we're, we're back to a point where uh, at least half of those we've lost are now uh, and, and now uh, in place or about to be in place. Uh, and that is obviously a foundation upon which we can uh, continue to improve uh, GMP uh, going forward. So, you know, that was the right thing to do to stop police numbers falling uh, to a point where uh, they got far, far too low. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's early days, but I think we are beginning to see signs of, uh, of, of improvement. Uh, and with this backing, I, I, will be held to account for saying this, but I'm confident it's true. Greater Manchester Police will make uh, over the course of this, this calendar year, particularly in uh, response to uh, calls, uh, both 101 and 999. Alongside those, uh, uh, those um, two critical um, uh, services, we are also looking at a new community messaging service where the named accountable teams we have in our uh, in our communities now are, are able to use a new community messaging system to improve uh, with local with local residents. So we appreciate it's a difficult time uh, to ask people for more money, but we didn't, as other areas did, go for the full amount for their police forces last year. We didn't, um, but now that we have got a direction of travel that uh, we believe the public uh, will support, it is the right time uh, to back. The police with with new with new resources and with some of the uplift in the government grant that we're uh, that we're receiving, um, we can also start to expand areas that have been neglected in recent times, such as roads policing. So we are looking at sixty new uh, uh, officers coming uh, on stream to support better better roads policing, uh, and we think these these things reflect uh, the priorities that people are uh, people are identifying. So uh, that's where we are with regard to, to Grace Manchester Police. Jen, turning to the second part of your question on clean air, obviously uh, there's a limit to what I can say on this at the moment, given that the Greater Manchester Clean Air Committee will be meeting later this week to consider whether to support the recommendation to the government uh, for a pause in the release of what we call the phase two funding uh, and then a, a review to be carried out of the scheme. Uh, the issues are identified though in that there's been a real change in the vehicle uh, market in the uh, course of 2021 and it's absolutely right uh, that we that we respond uh, to that um, and obviously we've been following that closely over the last uh, few months uh, I, I believe the leaders were right to make the intervention that they have 
um, but it is now for the committee to decide uh, whether or not to, to proceed with that request to government for, for a review. All I can say is, say is we are listening uh, to what people uh, are saying. Uh, we are under a legal direction. So although people like to say this has all been driven at a Greater Manchester level, that clearly isn't the case. You know, this is the law of the land. Um, we have to get the the air uh, down to, to, to legal levels. The government is requiring us to do that. Um, what we want to do is to do that, to clean up the air without losing a job, uh, a business or putting anybody into hardship. And we are obviously op open to any solutions that can obviously can help us achieve that. So it's a limit to what I can say today, gents. I don't want to preempt the, um, the, the conversation that the committee will have uh, later, later this week. But um, we, we had positive engagement with the government uh, last week when Michael Gove uh, visited. I think there is an understanding of the situation that we are in uh, and we very much want to work with the government uh, to get the right solution. Thanks. I'm going to go to Adam Clark. Adam, you should be able to unmute your microphone and ask your question now. Thanks, Ross. Andy, a, a couple of questions. One on, on GMP. Obviously, it's the, the Neighbourhood uh, Policing Week of Action. How key is uh, neighbourhood policing for uh, what GMP do and, and their various different resources? And secondly, you referenced the, the visit of Michael Gove uh, in the, the previous answer to Jen's question. Obviously, you uh, visited Gig Lane with him and other uh, local councillors in Bury. I just wondered what your uh, reaction is to the, the latest news regarding Bury Football Club and Gig Lane. Yeah, so firstly, uh, uh, Adam, I mean, neighbourhood policing is absolutely, um, if you like, right up there in terms of our, our, our priority. And it's why, as I said to, to Jen a moment ago, we've been kind of recruiting people to, to put back into our neighbourhood teams. And it's not just the, the frontline teams, it's also getting more resource into the boroughs at a senior level. So we've gone back to a chief superintendent for every borough. So the kind of process has been to, you know, to, to strengthen the whole uh, neighbourhood operation, both in terms of the teams that are out there and the supervision of those teams at the borough, at the borough level. And part of neighbourhood policing is, of course, improving communication. And I've just um, just described uh, described what we're doing uh, there. Um, and you know, o overall, um, it's about high impact, uh, responsive policing. And what GMP are committing to do is to maintain this year something they launched last year called Operation Avro. I don't know uh, if you've been following that, but this is um, an approach where uh, GMP are going round the boroughs and having high impact uh, days uh, where there's surge, surging of officers into particular boroughs, a real engagement with the with the issues that those communities are facing, confidence building. Uh, so this this process will 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 continue. Uh, throughout 2022. So, you know, I, I am absolutely confident that uh, Greater Manchester Police is moving in the right uh, direction. I could point you to, um, you know, to plenty of green shoots, actually, in terms of the improvements that they're making. But we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. You know, this is still a police force that needs to, to improve uh, further. Um, and, you know, that's why the, the money is important. They're moving in the right direction. So our judgment is now is the time uh, to, to support them, to back back them up with the resources that they, they need. Uh, and we're confident that residents will see those improvements throughout the second half, or not second half, throughout the rest of this uh, whole of this calendar calendar year. In terms of uh, Michael Goh's visit, it was a really uh, good visit, actually. And we were appreciative of the amount of time that that Michael spent in Greater Manchester visiting the um, the Mayfield site and the, the first public park in City Centre Manchester for 100 years, which really is taking shape, and it, it will be a fa fabulous resource for the city region. Uh, we had further discussions with, with, with Michael uh, before heading to Bury, as you said, and it was brilliant, actually, to, uh, to, to be there and kind of see that the last time I was there, you know, people's faces looked very different. Uh, there were dark clouds hanging over Gig Lane. It was not, not good for anyone who cares about football. Uh, in our communities or in this country, and it was just brilliant to be to be back there on Friday with blue skies above um, uh, Gig Lane, smiles on on faces, uh, and the monumental effort that's gone on at a local level from volunteers and supporters groups beginning to to bear fruit, and people beginning to feel that you know we're looking at a, a prospect now of football returning to to Gig Lane, 
um, within a reasonable uh, a reasonable time frame. What I did say to the um, to the uh, uh, supporters groups is that they've got my full support, particularly in uh, working with the FA to get um, obviously you know a Berry football a Berry football club back re-entering at, a, at an appropriate level given the club's history and given what the uh, supporters have have been through. So you know let's let's be realistic here and let's make sure that they can can re-enter at a level which means that the club can you know see a, see a reasonable path to regaining its league status within a uh, a, a reasonable time frame. So I'll be strongly supporting uh, the work of the supporters in, in that regard. Congratulations to Eamon O'Brien, leader of Berry Council. Berry Council obviously a, a approved funding and a backing at the club. We're all talking about how we can make Gig Lane uh, a real community resource at the heart of that area uh, of Berry. Um, so yeah, there's a huge amount of people now engaged uh, in, in restoring. Um, in due course, uh, league football uh, to the great town of, of Bury and the, the revival of Bury FC. So we're all engaged on that. They're working across political lines, national and local government working working together. You know, I, I hope um, after a really, really tough time, Bury fans can finally see some light at the end of the tunnel. Thanks, Andy. Cheers, Adam. We've only got one um, other question. So unless uh, any colleagues in the media would like to raise their hand now, uh, and ask a question. We'll finish after this question. So I'm going to go to uh, Marta. Uh, you should be able to unmute your microphone and ask your question now. Thank you so much. Uh, so just bringing everything back to COVID, uh, obviously you have talked about how we are not out of the woods, uh, but what do you think living with COVID uh, for the foreseeable future and the long term is going gonna, is gonna to look like? So thanks, Marta. Um, certainly I think um, it means not abandoning everything uh, at this particular moment in time. I think it's um, taking a gradual approach uh, to things, um, recognising that we are still at risk of, of new variants. Um, having said that, though, um, you know, bringing people back to our to our city um, and, and our towns. Um, you know, and encouraging people uh, to, to get back out there with, with some degree of confidence. But our point would be the one we made last year, that we'll give confidence to all people to get back out there, if you like, if we are maintaining uh, safe, sensible measures like the wearing of face coverings uh, in settings where people um, we, where people have to go, if you like, rather than where they choose uh, choose to go. So like, like public... Uh, public transport, continuing to stress the importance of the booster program. It works. It's effective. Why? Why not take it up? You know, everyone is going to put themselves in a much stronger position uh, by doing it. Uh, so as it goes down the age ranges, we would definitely say to, we will strongly be encouraging people uh, to take up uh, take up the booster. Um, I think that will be the the approach that we'll be looking for. Uh, working working with the government. We do, of course, have a, uh, an eye on um, on the economy. We do want to get people um, uh, back um, into our main main centres um, and supporting our businesses uh, there. Uh, but I think just learning from last year, doing it by not abandoning everything, if I can come back to that uh, to that phrase, because we don't think um, that that will be the right way the right way to go. So um, a, a gradual approach. Uh, Marta, recognising the risks that are still out there. Uh, but obviously, if we take that approach, it will mean that we are on a, if you like, a one-way path out of the pandemic, rather than where we have been, where we have a period of un unlocking or freedom, as it was described, and then we go back into a different position. I think we need to take a more steady, uh, one-way approach uh, to this, and, and that's what we'll certainly be calling for. Thanks, Andy. That's all. Thank um, you. Thanks, Marta. Um, that's and that's all. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining everyone.